I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, Lyndon Baines Johnson, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. I, William Jefferson Clinton. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. <laughs> Leaders, protectors, history makers. There is one job at the top that guarantees your name in the history books. A job that pledges to defend the Constitution and guard the free world. Freedom, liberty, and justice. The cornerstones of democracy and the oath of the President of the United States. Throughout the storied history of this great nation, many presidents have left their mark from this high office, and the actions they take decide the fate of millions of Americans. The personalities and gestures of each become part of their impenetrable legacy. Join us as we take an in-depth look at the journey and legacy of some of the most influential people in the history of humankind. These are the Presidents. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Ronald Reagan the 40th President of the United States, an ambitious and charming figure unlike any other in America's history. The speeches are over, and the audience is content with the sound of a promise. A leader who rocked the U.S. economy with his infamous Reaganomics and divided opinion both on home turf and abroad. Reagan was more than just a brilliant speechmaker more than a visionary. His political flair achieved progress, not just in America, but all over the world. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. No area of the world should have a higher priority than the place where we live, the Western Hemisphere. Here we look back at the most defining moments and how a former actor changed conservatism in America forever. How high is the price of freedom, but also how much it is worth that price? Ronald Reagan's early life differed from the privileged childhoods of many other presidents. Reagan was born on 6th of February, 1911, in a commercial building in Tampico, Illinois. His family actually moved around a lot when he was younger because his father was a shoe salesman, but eventually they settled and he grew up very, very poor. In fact, he didn't even have access to running water when he was a child. Uh, his father was an alcoholic and quite a difficult person, but he got along really well with his mother, who was considered to be really sweet and, and generous. Once the family settled in the city of Dixon, Reagan attended Dixon High School, where he developed his interests in drama and football. Reagan would go on to attend Eureka College, where he threw himself into sports, drama, and campus politics societies. However, he struggled to excel at his economic and sociology degree and remained a fairly mediocre student throughout his years at college. Ronald Reagan's film career started on a whim. As he was working as a sports announcer, he followed the Chicago Cubs out to Los Angeles. 
There, he decided to do a screen test for Warner Brothers, and he was signed a contract at $200 a week. He made more than 50 films. Some of the more notable ones were Love is in the Air, uh, and he also played the role of George Gipp in the Newt Rockney biography, and he had the famous line, win one for the Gipper. None of his movies were considered to be you know, critical darlings, uh, but he was a popular actor and movie star. Well, 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 Jack Curtis in person. That's the trouble with you actors, Ronnie. No appreciation for what we directors do to make you look good. Oh, Morgan would love to hear you say that. In 1938, Reagan starred in Brother Rat, alongside fellow actress Jane Wyman. The show business pair hit it off, and they married two years later in California. Jane and Ronald had three children, Maureen, Michael, and one-day-old Christine, who died shortly after birth. Unfortunately, the marriage broke down, and the acting couple divorced in 1949. Not long after, he would meet the actress Nancy Davis. Nancy Davis got in touch with him because he was president of the Screen Actors Guild, and she was worried that her name had been on a list of communist sympathizers, and he helped get her name off that list because there was another Nancy Davis who was active in that role. So they would then go on to marry in 1952 and have two children, Patricia and Ron, Ronald Reagan Jr. Without realizing it, Nancy Reagan would one day become one of the most influential first ladies in American history. Reagan's time as president of the Screen Actors Guild proved tumultuous and tense. In the late 1940s and 50s, America drove a nationwide persecution of communists and suspected sympathizers. Soon, the age of McCarthyism an anti-communist sentiment seeped into Hollywood. Ronald Reagan became president of the Screen Actors Guild in 1948, and he was pretty successful in this role. But he really had some issues and disputes with labor. In particular, he was suspicious that many members of Hollywood were members of the Communist Party. And so in the end, he would cooperate with the FBI and, in fact, agreed to testify before the House of Un-American Activities and would designate several members of Hollywood as communist sympathizers. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee interrogated actors, writers, and other creatives with communist ties. Lists of suspected communists were released in newspapers. The persecuted lost their jobs and were blacklisted in Hollywood. The question before this committee and the scope of its present inquiry will be to determine the extent of communist infiltration in the Hollywood motion picture industry. I never, as a citizen, want to see our country become so uh, or become urged by either fear or resentment of this group that we ever compromise with any of our democratic principles through that fear or resentment. Reagan's experience as president of the Screen Actors Guild changed his political views forever. He became a staunch anti-communist and moved away from his liberal mindset. Reagan wasn't always a right-wing Republican. In fact, in his early days, he was a Democrat. He was a great admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He called him an American hero. But over time, he started to feel that the communist influence in Hollywood was really becoming a problem. He felt that the labor unions were making life very, very difficult. Uh, and later in life, he would become more and more sympathetic to more free market policies. He really gained a philosophy from this period that the government wasn't really helping out business, that it actually was infringing upon the rights of individuals and the rights of, of big business and small business owners. One side in this campaign has been telling us that the issues of this election 
are the maintenance of peace and prosperity. The line has been used, we've never had it so good. But I have an uncomfortable feeling that this prosperity isn't something on which we can base our hopes for the future. No nation in history has ever survived a tax burden that reached a third of its national income. Today, 37 cents out of every dollar earned in this country is the tax collector's share. By 1962, he officially declared that he wasn't really any part of the Democratic Party anymore. He famously stated, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, they left me. I became a Republican not because the parties were the same, but precisely because they were different. In 1966, Reagan ran in the election for governor of California. He campaigned on the key issues of individual freedom and small government and appealed to many voters through his television speeches. Let me just, I know that you've already met the members of our team and your new senatorial candidate, Bob Stevens. And I think it's wonderful that Chuck Connors would come along because the manner in which the other team has been campaigning, it's time that some people were reminded that actors are people. Reagan defeated his opponent, Pat Brown, to become governor of California from 1967 to 1971. He was re-elected again for a second term in 1971 after defeating Jesse M. Ural with 52.85% of the vote. The speeches are over and the audience is content with the sound of a promise, the sight of a candidate's smile, the taste of Coca-Cola, the touch of a handshake, and the smell of autumn. By 1968, Ronald Reagan had become a very popular California governor, and he was such a star in the Republican Party that he started to feel that he could make a bigger impact by running for the big office for, for president. Reagan ran in the Republican presidential primaries in 1976, but proved unsuccessful. Jerry Ford, why are you asking your fellow Americans and your fellow Michiganders to let you go on being president for the next four years? My answer is very simple. Because I've done a good job, and I'm proud of it. Gerald Ford narrowly won the Republican nomination, but failed in the election to hold on to the White House. Democrat Jimmy Carter instead took his position in the Oval Office. Let us learn together and laugh together and work together and pray together, confident that in the end, we will triumph together in the right. 1980 turned out to be a very different story for Reagan. The 69-year-old Republican won the eyes and ears of voters. He was soon on track to become the 40th president of the United States. In four years, Mr. Carter's administration has managed to alienate our friends in the hemisphere, to encourage the destabilization of government, and to permit Cuban and Soviet influence to grow. We must take steps to change the Carter administration's sorry record of vacillation, alienation, and neglect. Jimmy Carter's presidency had not been an easy ride for the American public. The economy had weakened, and a period of great inflation hit the U.S. hard. Reagan was able to win such a landslide against Carter because of the state of the economy. In the U.S. at the time, there was incredible inflation. There wasn't much economic growth. There was a lot of despair about the direction that the economy was going in. And that was coupled with the perception that Jimmy Carter was ineffective in foreign policy. No one likes gasoline rationing, and we will avoid it if it is possible. But I will not hide from my responsibility to the nation. The incumbent president not only faced domestic issues, but also problems abroad. In 1979, 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage 
after a group of militarized Iranian students took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. President, uh, following up on your statement just now, when you were planning the rescue attempt, did you believe that all the hostages could have been removed from Iran safely, or did you feel that some could have been killed in the process? The Iran hostage crisis dominated the final 14 months of Carter's presidency. Republican opponent Ronald Reagan massively criticized the president's handling of the crisis and it soon became a point of contention for voters. My criticism, I don't mind criticizing what has been done. And frankly, I don't think the president has done anything that he couldn't have done five months ago. In 1980, Ronald Reagan's dream of reaching the highest office in the land came true. Reagan won a decisive victory, claiming 44 states and 489 electoral votes. His Democrat opponent, Jimmy Carter, lost re-election in a landslide defeat. The Reagan era came crashing through the doors of the White House, and nothing could stand in its way. Reagan came in in his plain speaking, uh, affable way, communicating to the public, and as his, he was known as the great communicator. Uh, and he was able to really resonate that he could make a difference. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Carter's unpopularity and poor economic performance opened up an opportunity for Reagan to inspire new hope. And he used his inaugural address to promote small government policies. Reagan spoke about the U.S. as a country that had great potential, and he tried to communicate this idea that individuals have the power to, to create their own destiny and that the individual uh, could achieve great things. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Only two months into his first term, Reagan faced an attack on his life. There has been an assassination attempt on President Reagan. The president has been hit. He has a wound, we believe, in his upper shoulder. John Hinckley Jr. fired six times at the president outside the Washington Hilton. The bullet struck press secretary James Brady, police officer Thomas Delante, and Secret Service agent Tim McCarty. Whilst escaping the scene in the president's limousine, Secret Service agents and staff noticed blood coming from Reagan's mouth. Hinckley had shot the 40th president in the lung. The president recovered in a local hospital and luckily survived what could have been a fatal gunshot wound. On a popularity high, Reagan stepped up the heat in tackling the economic mess. Ronald Reagan developed a set of neoliberal reforms named Reaganomics, which pushed for lower taxes, deregulation, and free trade. Yesterday, as you know, I had an opportunity to meet with the nation's governors, and they all recognized that this program will require some belt tightening, but many of them also agreed that only if our government grows less will our economy grow more. And finally, I'm pleased that this morning, Senators Pete Domenici of New Mexico and Fritz Hollings of South Carolina are together introducing a reconciliation resolution in the Senate so that the Congress can begin speedy and earnest deliberation on our proposals. 
Reagan is known for Reaganomics, which was this economic strategy or set of policies that included trying to encourage economic growth, trying to curtail inflation, cutting taxes, cutting social spending, but increasing defense spending. However, Reagan's reforms more greatly benefited the rich rather than those at the bottom of the economic. The policies targeted social and welfare programs, leaving many Americans financially desperate and plunging deeper into poverty. What was meant to create more individual freedom, in fact, made America even more unequal. Because Reagan believed that government was the problem uh, and, and that it was really impeding on you know, the spirit of the individual, uh, you saw there was not just huge tax cuts, but also huge cuts in government regulations. And that really allowed the banks to do whatever they wanted to do. And they ran amok with all kinds of loans, sometimes very high-risk loans that we had never really seen in the U.S. before. The other thing is that Reagan engaged in huge cuts in, in social spending, 22 billion was actually cut. And in particular, he was going after programs that supported the poor. This meant uh, support for food stamps, um, support for low-income housing. In fact, housing was probably the area that he honed in on the most. And this would, of course, lead to a million people becoming homeless because they didn't have the support coming from the government. Reaganomics did show a level of success in some areas. Reagan ultimately stopped the economy from spiraling out of control and influenced future political leaders to adopt a similar strategy. The 40th president not only faced huge problems at home. In the early 1980s, tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union increased. Reagan urgently needed to tackle the overseas challenges head on. The 45-year standoff between the U.S. and the USSR started at the end of World War II. Soon after the surrender of Nazi Germany in May 1945, the rocky alliance between the U.S. and the Soviet Union began to unravel. If history teaches anything, it teaches that simple-minded appeasement or wishful thinking about our adversaries is folly. It means the betrayal of our past, the squandering of our freedom. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. By 1948, the Soviet Union had installed left-wing governments in Eastern European countries. America and Britain soon feared Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and the spread of communism in the West. In retaliation, the U.S. sought to provide aid to Western European countries and place them under American influence. The Soviet Union also developed their own nuclear weapons, ending the American monopoly on the atomic bomb. These actions sent the world into a state of paranoia. People began building bomb shelters. The U.S. government launched nuclear safety adverts on the television, and children practiced drills in school. A dark shadow spread across the world. These children are practicing to duck and cover, just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. In 1961, the Iron Curtain in Europe took on a physical form. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev ordered East German soldiers to build a wall 
and close off access between East and West Berlin. The wall soon became the ultimate symbol of division. When Reagan became president, he made it his primary mission to create peace through strength. Ronald Reagan was suspicious of the Soviet Union for decades. He didn't believe any of the presidents were taking a strong enough stance, in particular Jimmy Carter. He disagreed with detente. He disagreed with containment. He wanted to force the Soviet Union to its knees by outspending it in military defense. Defense spending more than doubled. And this was at a time that the Soviet Union was already spending up to 15% of its own GDP on military spending. And so he was able to push the Soviet Union into an arms race that it couldn't really handle. However, by 1985, the world was shifting. Mikhail Gorbachev took over as leader of the Soviet Union and soon became one of the most significant figures of the 20th century. Gorbachev led a mission to rebuild the economy, improve living standards in Soviet Union countries, and promote openness and freedom of expression. Reagan was a staunch anti-communist, but in Gorbachev, he found a Soviet leader the U.S. could finally negotiate with. Gorbachev was a different type of leader. He was one that really recognized the trade-offs that the Soviet Union faced and that it could no longer really survive if it continued to both support all the Eastern European countries that were part of its bloc and subsidize them while also pursuing a military spending strategy that was just completely unsustainable. 1987 became a particularly important year for peacemaking. In a visit to West Berlin, Ronald Reagan gave one of his most powerful speeches. The moment inspired hope across a divided nation. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The same year, Reagan and Gorbachev also signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, agreeing to eliminate a weapons class and reduce their nuclear weapons stockpiles. An historic and profound moment on both sides. I will sit down with the Soviet Union for as long as it takes to negotiate a balanced and equitable arms limitation agreement designed to improve the prospects for peace. To succeed at arms control, however, we must first be honest with ourselves so that we can be convincing with the Soviets. We must honestly face the facts of the arms competition in which we're caught. And we must have a view of the world that is consistent with these facts and that doesn't change to suit different audiences. Despite critical debate, Ronald Reagan's strength, courage, and prophetic speeches helped push the world towards closing the door on the Cold War. We have listened to the wisdom of, in an old Russian maxim, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. My, Mr. General Secretary, though my pronunciation may give you difficulty, the maxim is dovayai no provayai. Trust, but verify. <laughs> you repeat that at every meeting. <laughs> Shall
human immunodeficiency virus, HIV for short. They are engulfed by phagocytes, but they are not destroyed. And they go on to attack the cells that produce antibodies, leaving the body defenseless. The decade threw an array of intense issues at Reagan. Some of the worst started on home soil. In the early 80s, a new unknown illness spread across America. Doctors had discovered clusters of pneumonia in previously healthy homosexual men in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. The Center for Disease Control began to investigate. When AIDS hysteria was starting to take over the nation, the U.S. government initially thought that this was a disease that was really only affecting certain groups, that it didn't really prioritize, whether it be drug users or, or homeless people or uh, hemophiliacs or homosexuals or immigrants. They didn't really think it could affect the general population. And when it started to really spread, they started to see that this could really affect all Americans and, and that it was going to require huge amounts of, of research. Reagan now faced an invisible enemy. However, his delayed reaction in devising a battle strategy stoked division. News of the virus hit headlines in Thatcher's Britain. And it wasn't long until the disease made its way over the Atlantic. I just, in the few minutes we've got left, turn to something which is being spoken of as the biggest threat that mankind has ever had to face. And that's notwithstanding nuclear weapons. I'm talking about AIDS. Is there any truth in the suggestion one hears that this government has been dragging its feet on AIDS because of your distaste for the whole subject, that you perhaps feel that being explicit in telling the public what it's all about would be somehow quite offensive? Originally identified as a gay disease, U.S. and U.K. society sought to ostracize homosexual males. Gay people must unite to overcome discrimination against people with AIDS. If we do not, we will all suffer. We will all be defeated. We will all truly be victims of AIDS. We're fighting for funds and we're fighting for, for our rights as individuals, as human beings, that they cannot, they simply cannot put us away in leper colonies, which seems to be what they're, what they're talking about doing now. Like some prison officers demanding protective clothing, some policemen wearing masks and gloves when dealing with homosexuals, some morticians refusing to embalm the bodies of AIDS victims. The disease continued to spread, and diagnosis came with a large dose of prejudice and hate. Reagan had to deal with the Christian rights backlash against homosexual groups, whereas in the UK, Thatcher faced uproar from the right-wing press, who spread hysteria and relentlessly targeted the gay community. The one difference, though, was that the campaign of the Thatcher government was more pragmatic. She wasn't saddled with some of the elements of the Christian right that was part of the Republican Party in the U.S. And so she was able to pursue a more effective and pragmatic campaign to encourage her citizens to, to use contraception and to practice safe sex. And that was something that the more puritanical U.S. public didn't have the same type of campaign. Soon, both the UK and US governments had to accept that the disease was not just affecting homosexuals, ethnic minorities, and drug users. Reagan and his closest allies had no choice but to tackle the epidemic head on.
The end of Ronald Reagan's presidency showcased huge changes in American society. Inequality was rife, and national debt had tripled. His infamous Reaganomics plan had left a lot to be desired. When Reagan left office in 1989, the U.S. was changed forever. I mean, one of the biggest changes was the fact that the, the U.S., ideologically speaking, had moved to the right. Conservatism had been revived. Uh, the moderates in the Republican Party had all moved to the right and had been infiltrated by the Christian right in particular. And you saw that there was nonstop bashing of the government. It became commonplace that people didn't feel that the government could do much for you and that we needed to get the government more and more out of people's daily lives. The legacy that Reagan left behind really depends on, on who you're asking. So today, he's very popular. You have 75% of Americans that view him fondly. When he left office, he had an approval rating of 53%. But in the end, he moved the party to the right. It became more conservative with a capital C. It was more in favor of extreme policies that have shifted, actually, American political culture as well. But maybe you and I have done better than we know, those of us who talk of conservatism, because the great majority of the people today believe with us. They may not be able to put a label on it, but their approach to the various policies of government is the same as ours. We see that historians feel that his Reaganomics policies didn't work, and you saw that in addition to a pervasive homelessness problem, pervasive problems in urban areas that have never really recovered, we had huge uh, increases in income inequality. The U.S. became the most unequal industrialized nation in the world. Reagan achieved great success with foreign policy. He built strong relationships with foreign leaders and pushed further than any president before him for negotiations with the Soviet Union. Less than a year after leaving office, the Berlin Wall finally fell, and Germany became united once again. And through another hole, another East German player takes advantage of the new liberties after all, about New Year's Eve. Anything goes tonight. Yeah. Bits of the wall are still being chipped out as souvenirs. It's not easy. For the young, the sparklers are the attraction. They'll just know when they're much older that they were here for this historic moment. As a former actor and big personality, Reagan's presidency transformed the political system in America. Reagan charmed the U.S. public from start to finish. And his time in office no doubt opened up a gateway for future celebrity presidents like Donald Trump. I've never said I'm a perfect person, nor pretended to be someone that I'm not. We will make America great After life at the White House, Ronald and Nancy Reagan returned to California and retired to his home in Bel Air, Los Angeles. Up until contracting Alzheimer's, Reagan spent his time writing memoirs, creating the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, and riding horses at his ranch. In 1994, Reagan decided to publicly announce his diagnosis with Alzheimer's to help raise awareness of the illness. He largely disappeared from public view as the disease progressed, and in 2005, the news of his death hit international headlines.
It's an outburst of pageantry which has America entirely in its grip. A nation which did away with royal pomp and circumstance, savoring this moment, celebrating the embodiment of the American dream. And beneath the Capitol dome, the lying in state. The president's lieutenants and supporters gathered round, serving now as then. He once said, there is no question I am an idealist, which is another way of saying I am an American. People from across America traveled to Washington, D.C. to say farewell to a much beloved public servant. Former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Soviet Union leader Mikhail Gorbachev also attended, paying their respects to a once great ally and close friend in the political world. And not only with Americans, just a few minutes ago, in walked that other giant of the late Cold War era, Mikhail Gorbachev, the final president of the country that Reagan had called the evil empire. Together they had shared so many dramas and written so much history. Rob Ronald Reagan's passing deeply saddened not only the American public, but people across the world. An era of big political players seemed to be quietly slipping away. So help me God. Now I congratulate you, sir. I never in my life intended or believed that I would ever uh, have a desire to, to run for office. Ronald Reagan's promotion of individual freedom guided America down a new path, and one which would change the political system forever. His infamous Reaganomics failed to reach high success levels. However, Reagan's actions during the Cold War helped push back the Soviet Union save millions of lives and ultimately alter the course of the world. We seek neither confrontation nor conflict, but to avoid both, we must remain strong and determined to protect our interests. The great communicator wanted only the best for the American people. His vision still sits in the hearts and minds of many, three decades after he left office. Whatever the history books might say about Ronald Reagan, he will certainly go down as one of the most memorable and iconic presidents in American politics.